Money, do you, do you, have you had this experience? Do you, or do you find that everything you tweet gets a ton oh, of no, retweets? No, I mean, I, you're, you're absolutely right. Most, most of the time you're tweeting in obscurity and yeah. uh, it's, it's also about, I feel like sometimes I tweet just things that I don't expect to get big or I don't really care much if they get big. I'm just right. being myself and I want to share. Um, but uh, particularly when, you know, I've uh, maybe written a column I'm particularly proud of or I think should really, I hope has an impact right. or I kind of worked on it because I hope it has an impact, that's when I'll spend the effort to find, okay, who, who, do, who might have some relationship with me that knows something about this topic, who would and be interested to read this, my yeah. column and might send it along. So it's when I'm, it's when I'm personally invested in, in, in getting it spread. It's not necessarily all the time. And I'm gonna show you a new platform and a new tool that will change the way Moni just described what she's doing. She, doesn't even, she won't even have to think about who to accelerate it to. And some of you were the recipients of that tool. You didn't even know that happened, and I'll explain that in a little while. That's a, just a teaser out there. But think about YouTube. How many hours of YouTube video is uploaded on YouTube every minute? Does anybody know? What's the number? It keeps increasing. It was 48 hours just two years ago. What is it now? Anybody know? It's 72 hours every minute. I tell people the safest place to put your top secret video is on YouTube. <laughs> Nobody will see it, right? You put it on there and then you've got to work. The work is just starting when you, when you put it online. And this is a message that I bring from years of watching journalists, right? This part of the problem is the vocabulary and the grammar of journalism. Uh, I know there are some people who speak other languages, but English is particularly bad. What are some of the terms we use? Have you turned in your story? Have you put the issue to bed? Are you done? Are you finished? Let's wrap it up, right? I tell people that when you turn in the story, the work is just beginning. That's not the end. I did, a, as some of you know, I did a startup in New York called um, Digital News and Information, called dnainfo.com. We hired uh, about 25 journalists first, and now we're about 100 people in New York and in uh, Chicago. And uh, the, that's the URL, dnainfo.com, and it's hyperlocal news. And you know there's a lot of buzz about hyperlocal, but this one is built around journalists and reporters and multimedia folks. And our mantra there was, when you turn in the story, your work is just beginning. So what are some examples? Uh, you heard Moni give hers, that she thinks, after she writes the column, who might be interested in this? Right? So that's one way to do it. Another is to build lists of people that you want to reach out to. I tell my, I tell, I'm not directly involved with these folks anymore. They've just done a great job on their own and are doing fantastic. I was the world's first Hindu editorial rabbi. Uh, my job was to kind of give them feedback about how they're doing. Things. I helped put the team together, wrote the business plan, all of that stuff. But they have done an amazing job. Uh, I, I was very minimally involved, really. But what they... Uh, what we tell them is, once you turn in the story, then you need to do mass, mass amounts of this really brand new technology called email. Because uh, you have to take that story and get it to people. You are responsible, folks, for your own audience. You are responsible for your own audience in the way that if people are hiring today, two people of equal skill, equal skill, equal experience, they're going to hire the people who are more socially active online. Why? Because if you're not willing to work really hard for your own stories, how do I know you're going to do a great job with the stories you do for me, right? So taking some pride in your social is, uh, is going to be, this is not the case yet everywhere, but it's going to be a sign of how much you care and what you bring to the table. Remember, I said equally skilled. On the other hand, if someone's more experienced, has better shooting ability, better photography, better editing skills, they should be hired. But of equal stature, equal work, equal experience, I would go with the more socially active person. And that's why you are here tonight to learn how we can do a better job of that. Everybody, I hope you, caught, you, you got this. So let's look at some uh, case studies of this. This is a piece I, uh, I tweeted on, uh, sorry, an item I tweeted when Facebook hit a billion followers, right? of uh, users, and this was on October 4th, 19, uh, sorry, 2012, and I posted this on there. It got eight retweets, and eight retweets is pretty good, you know, but you know, I thought this would be like really big, and it wasn't, and uh, it's a feeling sometimes you have, people ask me a lot about uh, Follow Friday. Uh, if you, when you're new to Twitter and somebody does a Follow Friday, you're so excited. 
because you don't really know what it is, but it sounds like thousands of people are going to follow you now. And I was like ready. I was like, okay, I'm going to have all these new followers. I'm ready to IPO. It was great. I was just going to be so successful. And I think I got like one, one person following me. So sometimes when you think you're going to be successful, it doesn't work. work. But let's just think, think about this here. One of the ideas I have is we must all become students of our own social media. What is working? What's not working? Uh, how, do, how do I Im amplify, improve, optimize what we do? And we'll talk about that. So you saw this. This is not bad. But watch what happened at 6 p.m. when I tweeted a similar thing. Same day. Right? That's amazing, right? A thousand <laughs> retweets. I, I, it, was, it was unbelievable. So what are some lessons from this? That people love social good. You know this thing called hash social good where you're trying to improve the world. And, uh, and some people have a less flattering name for this. What do they call it? Slacktivism, right? You're a slacker and you feel like you're an activist because you tweeted something. And people hate that, but I disagree. I think if a thousand people around the world for 30 seconds thought about this idea that a billion people are hungry, that that's worth something. It's better than nothing is what I, what I think of that. Uh, the other lesson I learned from this is everything matters about who retweets you and what happens. So if you look at the bottom, who retweeted me? At Jack, who is at Jack? Jack Dorsey is the creator of Twitter who in 2006 did the first tweet. And he was on a little show called 60 Minutes last night. I don't, how many of you saw his 60 Minutes piece, right? It's online. I urge you to go back and look at it online. Uh, terrific piece, uh, 15 minutes on uh, about him. And he also created a new thing called Square, which is a payment uh, service. And he did both. And, and he's a very interesting guy. But if you look at this, so he retweeted it. And who's the other person who retweeted it? At Nick Kristoff. Right? And you know Nick Kristoff. He's actually from the Pacific Northwest and talks a lot about it. And so who amplifies you is more important maybe than, uh, you know, than the content itself. And I'm going to show you a tool a little bit later that will help you identify your most influential followers. This is really important. Why? Because who follows you is not as important as who follows who follows you. Right? Your followers aren't as important as the followers of the people who follow you. So I'm going to give you that tool also in a little bit. Let me pause here and ask if you guys have any thoughts on this. Others will keep going. I just one little thought that uh, it, even though that most of your social media isn't being seen by anybody, my attitude is this whole embassy and country thing is actually truly important. So if you do have your own country, such as your own website, and what I do is I actually have my latest tweets on my website as well. And so if somebody's checking you out, this is a chance for you to sort of audition how you express yourself and the things that are interesting to you. So you should see not the social media channel necessarily is always trying to get attention, but also as almost like SEO or archives of the things that have mattered to you when people are checking you out. This is why I post to Google Plus that SEO matters even though nobody I know is really on Google Plus, but I still think it's important to use those channels from that point of view. Perfect, that's the perfect attitude to this. Uh, you can see my site, it looks like it's not been updated since 1986, <laughs> but, uh, but it's updated every five, you know, five times a day thanks to my tweets being right here, or if you scroll down further, my Facebook is right here, or you know, YouTube, all of that is on here. And you can use these widgets to do that. And just for fun, I put up this thing called audio name. You can see right up at the top that plays your, your, how to pronounce, pronounce your name. And so you can, you can see that. You go in here. I Oops, sorry. <laughs> we've got... Uh, it's to the beat. It's a reggae got, beat. <laughs> to the reggae beat is still going on. All right, let's try that again. Let's, let's see if we can... So it's called audio name. I believe this is made in Seattle. Do you, anybody know if this is made in Seattle? But anyway, so it's just a fun little, fun little thing that, uh, that I've, been, uh, I've been playing with. But what you heard him say is absolutely right. Now here's a tip. Every time I tweet, I try to do an at mention, a hashtag, and a link. Of the three, what's the most important? In some ways, it's the handle, right? I try to do a handle, an at mention, or a handle a hashtag and a link. But the handle's really important because if, if no one sees your tweet, at least one person sees it. Who's that? 
the person you mentioned, right? Because people, even no matter how big they are, they will check you out to see when you do that. I, I learned this from one of my colleagues, went and had an interview, one of those junket interviews where the celebrity sits there and the reporters change, and it was uh, Lance Armstrong pre-crisis. And he said, uh, he said, hey, uh, hello, and she said her name, and he said, hey, thanks for your tweet yesterday. And this is a guy with thousands of people tweeting at him, but he cared enough to kind of pay attention to that. And a reminder, go name check these people. Name check at Jack, name check at Nick Kristoff, and, uh, and especially Nick because he's in the Northwest. The other thing that you can do about this is that photograph. It's very important that you have a recent recognizable photo of you. Not you as a child, not you with a child, or not of your child. This is work, folks, as you heard Hanson say. Right? You saw both their bios. We, never, we didn't rehearse this. They both have professional, strong bios on there, and that's how you do. But if you look at Hanson's, he has a little bit of personality in there. Right? He says he falls asleep during the Ben-Hur chariot race. That's pretty funny. And uh, he won't have that on permanently, but it's there for now. I actually put that on yesterday. <laughs> you, yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but you, can, you can keep editing and changing and, uh, and doing that. So I, I don't know if that answers uh, your, your question. So just be kind of thinking about that as we're going forward. Questions, anybody? All right, we're going to um, go back to the slides here. The reason I talk about always be collecting is you never know what's going to trigger some success, right, or some action. So if you look at this, because I post, if I'd never posted it, I would never have had this, this little uh, bump here. But I was feeling so good about the thousand tweets, <laughs> retweets, when I went and looked at Neil deGrasse Tyson's tweets. Have you seen, you know, all know who he is? This amazing um, uh, uh, physicist, uh, astrophysicist, I think is the right, um, uh, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Let's look at his Twitter handle. So you can all see it here. It's Neil Tyson. Neil Tyson. I think that's his new handle, right? It's, it's changed over time. But he's at the American Museum of Natural History. And during the uh, first debate, the one with the PBS, remember the presidential debate with the PBS crisis and Big Bird? He tweeted something that got, wait for it, 58,000 retweets. And it was a very geeky, inside baseball, like hard to understand to, for most normal people. So here I was with 1,000 retweets thinking it's cool, but he got 58,000 on, like on a Tuesday or whatever it was. So it just shows you like all of this is kind of relative, but all that matters is have you felt some success? Don't focus on that number of the 1,000, but what are you incrementally able to have success on certain items? So this always be collecting, let me give you another example. I subscribe to two daily newspapers print newspapers still today, and I think I will for a while. And one, one day I was sitting in the subway and I saw a letter to the editor. And I often do this on my Facebook and my Twitter. I will take pictures of print things and put them on there, magazine covers and other things. And it was a letter from Desmond Tutu to the New York Times about the drone policy. So I took it and put it on Facebook and something astonishing happened. Usually, if I'm lucky, I get two shares, right? That's different from the retweets. Uh, um, from two shares and a few comments and some likes, but look what happened instead. I had never seen 935 likes, 100 comments, and then 4,000 shares. And this is important. This was a photograph taken in a moving train of Bishman Tutu's letter in the print edition of the New York Times. And one of the ideas I have, in, in, in addition to always be collecting, is be in the game, participate, right? Something's going on, say something. You're in the Seattle, Seattle right? You post something on there. You don't know what, what that's going to trigger. You, you'll say, well, nobody will see it, but you have no chance if you don't participate. So if you want to say, worst workshop ever, Seattle, just say that, and you'll see that somebody will respond to you and, and cheer you on, and you'll all walk out, whatever happens. But here's my wife, Rupa, who normally has, uh, you know, she, if, she, if she gets two or three shares, it's a lot for her. She'll tell you that. She took this, shared it, and look what happened. Right? The downstream value of sharing is we're just getting a sense of that. We're just starting. Right? When you see something, post it to your group. Post it to your people because folks are interested. And we think everyone sees everything. It's just not true. Right? 
the thoughtful letter, she said that, and 99 shares. And you've got to be in the game if you want to, uh, want to do that. The trends that I, I'm keeping an eye on in 2013 here is social, obviously, mobile, video, and local, and geolocation. That's going to be increasingly important. And how these tools come together to do this is going to inform a lot of what we're doing and thinking about as we go forward. That looks a little like 2009, doesn't it? Yeah, it also <laughs> looks like, you know, 2000. You could, you could say that about almost anything. Uh, but here are four things that social media can do for, for social media pros, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this, but give Moni a chance to kind of respond to these four. I think most journalists and media people, PR and Mark, Marcom and all of that, only think about one, two, or three of those. Almost no one I know, including me, thinks enough about all four of these. When I taught my first course for credit at Columbia, I said to my students, if your parents knew you're paying Columbia tuition for a course on Twitter and Facebook, they're going to call my boss, Nick Lemon, who some of you know from the New Yorker, and get me fired. So I said, we've got to think about it in a strategic manner. And these are the four things. Find new ideas, trends, and sources. Connect with readers and viewers in new, deeper ways. Bring eyeballs, traffic, and attention to your work. And create, craft, and enhance your brand. Nothing's more important than building all four of these into your work. So I'm going to go first to Moni and then to Hanson. If you have a thought about any of these, uh, do you emphasize one or more of these on your own personal work? Well, I'll say that the, the last one is the one that I try to think about the least, um, though I sometimes fail at that. So quick story. Um, you guys know Clout? Anyone ever heard yeah. of Clout? Cloud is like a, a site that gives you a score for how influential you are. And we will talk are. more about it, but tell yeah, your story. Yeah, so I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> cloud is the thing I just, I can't stay away, but I really want to. Like every few days, I'm like, oh, cloud. I should check my cloud score. And so I go and check it, and then I feel terrible immediately. <laughs> I feel just awful. Like, I care about a score? Who am I? Um, <laughs> so uh, the way I feel about it is, well, you know, some things are clearly brands, like organizations, companies, professional things, you know. Um, but are people really brands? And I'll be honest, I've always had a problem uh, with, that, with that categorization when applied to me. Um, when I started on Twitter, it was, uh, it was just for fun. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, have, I get a little eh when I think of myself as a brand. Um, and I find that oftentimes um, that, that fourth bullet point it's, it's kind of most successful when you're not too worried about it in that you just, you just be yourself and hopefully, you know, things kind of happen. But, but yeah, it, the clout thing just kills me and I'm trying to kind of, you know, it, w does the number really matter? I mean, it, I, I think social media is strongest when everybody's just being themselves to, to as much as possible. Well, I think, I mean, I'll, sh sh yeah, no, I think Monica's right about the authenticity. However, um, we had this conversation a lot in my class with my students who are a mix of marketing, PR, and journalism, or journalists. And I, I think in this current ecosystem of chaos, um, I actually want every one of our students to become brands and, cr and, and, and trusted experts in whatever they're most passionate about because you cannot just rely anymore on the institution that you've allied yourself, whether it's Microsoft that you work for or Boeing or whatever else, to depend on that for the rest of your career. That I think you need to be subject matter experts in your own right. And so you should build a channel or a brand around that in this new world and be able to connect to people through that. So uh, I agree with all four of those things. I practice all four of those things. But I do believe, no matter how squeamish we feel about this, that fourth one is crucial for our careers in this new world. Thank you. I, and I, I urge you to be thinking about what can you do to accelerate and improve your activities on all four of these. And we'll, we'll, we can talk more about that as well. Let's just go in here and see how many of you, even though I begged you to retweet it, that's not bad, but only 34 out of 200 people, right? This is hard, folks. People don't want to do something. Even though they're sitting here in this room listening to every word I say, doesn't mean they're going to do it. They're going, oh, yeah, really? You think I'm going to tweet this? You think I'm going to retweet this? This is hard, right? That's one of the things you're going to learn uh, uh, as, you, as, as you, and you guys know this already. So think about all four of these things. <laughs> <laughs> Who here is old enough to know what this is? This is the cover of National Lampoon in the 70s or 80s, I believe. 73? Is that correct? 73. Uh, and the cover said, buy this issue or we'll shoot this dog. Right? And why I'm showing this to you is that 
I have the feeling that's what journalism is turning into, where we're begging people to please share this, like us, tweet us, post us, please, 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 email us all the time. And I think we overdo it. And you might remember Rick Sanchez on CNN. He used to always say, hey, CNN, tell us what's going on. I mean, hey, people, tell us what's going on in TV land. And, and John Stewart had this great line where he paused the tape and he said, no, you're CNN. You tell us what's going on, right? <laughs> That's why I'm tuning in. I didn't... So this is important that at a time when everyone's a publisher, everybody's a journalist, everyone's a brand, people ask me, Sri, you know, you're, you're working at a, you know, you, you, why do people get trained at a journalism school? Why do you do that? Or why do you come to a great institution like, uh, like this one in here at Com Lead? And I tell people that at a time when everybody is posting and sharing and everything, the professional trained folks stand taller. And if they're more important than ever before, not less. More influential than ever before, not less, if you play your cards right and if you know what you're doing. So I'm going to just show you a couple of things, what I call signs of the times and not the LA Times or the New York Times. This is from uh, Facebook. This is the admiral in charge of NATO operations in Libya, uh, the last crisis, not the recent Susan Rice crisis, but the other one. And when you look at this, this, tweet, this Facebook posting was posted 30 minutes before the press release and an hour before the press conference. Why would they do that on Facebook? Any thoughts? Several reasons, right? First is as a trial balloon. You post this up there, and then people shoot at it, right? So that when he walks up to the podium an hour later, his PR person can give him a list of all the nastiest questions, because it's all been blogged and tweeted to death already. Second reason you're doing it is to reach the right audience. And when you look at this, who is the audience for this tweet, oh, this Facebook posting? The people of Libya. They're not hanging around on www.nato.gov slash we will bomb you to death, right? Where are they? They're just living their lives in Libya. This injects your work into their conversation and into their lives. That's the value of this. The other thing you're seeing here is the 500-ish social actions, right? How many friends does the average person have on Facebook? Anybody know? It's about 150 people. How many of you have more than 150 friends on Facebook? Raise your hands. Don't be shy. Everybody, right? This is why I came here, because I knew you were above average, Hanson. Otherwise, I would not have shown up here if these people were not above average. But when you look at this, the, the important thing are all their friends, not just themselves, right? So that's what you're, you're seeing on here. And the final reason might be, or one of the other reasons might be, that the People are always obsessed. How do I get more followers? People are always asking me, and I'm going to give you my formula at the end. But what, what I tell people is that don't worry about your new followers. You heard Moni sort of allude to this. Don't worry about getting more followers. Service the followers you have today. And by putting this up there, he's servicing his current customers instead of worrying about the new customers. So you can imagine what happened the, when this ran, say one journalist got the story and ran with it, and her competitor at another newsroom didn't get the story, he gets called in by his editor and says, hey, what happened? How come you missed the story? And he says, well, he posted on Facebook. I didn't even know they had a Facebook account, right? So we have to change the way we deal with our sources. Step one among all the things you do is to ask, are you on Twitter? Are you on Facebook? and follow up and track them if you can. And there's a wonderful tool to do that called Reportive. Is anybody using that? One hand in this room. This is going to change. Uh, it, it changed my life uh, on this. Let me just show you. And I need a more interesting life because it can be changed very easily. Uh, this. Anybody familiar with this? So one person, right? Reportive will change your Gmail life. It works in Firefox, Safari, Chrome, et cetera. It builds this pane. You see this pane over there? And when you type someone's name, it shows you their latest tweets. And, it, and, it, and there's a place where you can keep a little notebook, when the birthday is, what they're doing, et cetera. And this was bought by LinkedIn. Yes. We're trending. Take a picture. Send it to me. Hey, we're trending, everybody. Hey, first time. Yeah, My first time trending in silver. You're so excited, clearly. Uh, <laughs> uh, Let's trend nationally. We can do it, folks. 200 people tweeting, we can trend nationally. Um, but we have to compete with all those awful, like, you know, dating jokes and things like that. But, but this is really useful 
and I urge you to uh, check that out. And I have this, I have two friends named Zach Seward, and often I'll write the email to the wrong person, but it never happens now because their photo shows up as you type, and it shows you the last thing. So very important, we are living in a time when people telegraph what they're working on, what their mindset is. It's never happened before, right? So people, I tell PR people all the time, please use this when you're contacting folks. And journalists, I say, please use this when you're contacting sources so that you're not going in there and saying, hey, I need an interview stat. And you look and it says, you know, I'm on vacation or I'm at my grandmother's funeral, right? You're now getting people through their social status. What is another place you can look for this? In Gmail status, right? The Gmail chat status. People put what they're doing in there. This is the first time in history that we're, we're doing this. You can get Facebook, LinkedIn, Skype, and you can make little notes in there if you haven't done this already. Someone had a question, yes. I was just gonna tell you, this is very similar to a local scale thing we did called my Blackberry called Gift. It's a key in hand company. Oh, Blackberry good. is bought into the data, but it basically scrubs your contacts or their Twitter or their Facebook. Nice. It's like an old ad clipping service that we did. It's called GIST, G -I is it still available? Okay, so you'll look it up and you'll tell us again and then we'll want to put it on the live stream. So thank you. So that's great. Any kind of localization that you can do of the stuff I talk about, please, please let me know. And if you want to tweet at Rahul Vora and tell, tell him we're talking about him here, that'd be cool. Questions from anybody about this? All right, we're going to keep rolling here. Um, and so you obviously you're seeing that even these generals and folks like that are doing this. Here's another sign of the times. Everyone see the... Um, buffering sign in the middle of that, right? And I posted this in my CNET blog and someone wrote in the comments they waited five minutes for the picture to load. <laughs> they, they just thought this was like they were waiting, right? And that's the world we live in where we're constantly waiting for something, some doodad gizmo to respond to us. And it's so frustrating, right? And that's, that's what you see here. Uh, most of you never saw this cover. We're in the world where you can be on the cover of the New Yorker and everybody misses you, right? That's another thing you see. Um, do people in here still care about basketball? I understand they don't anymore, right? Or, no, I'm joking. But anyway, in New York, we had this thing for two minutes called Jeremy Lin Sanity. Anybody remember this? You, uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun. Um, and I think Lin Sanity is now sitting on a bench in Houston, but that's another story. Uh, it's like inside basketball joke, okay. <laughs> you see the hashtag there, Lin Sanity? This was one of the first times a hashtag was on a cover. What you could have done with this, taken maybe put it right on that orange and nice, nice bigger letters, but you could have done that, that's pretty cool. And then we also wanna talk about the other side of what we call hashtag hijack. Hashtag hijack is a problem. Once, we, if we start trending nationally, we'll, our, our Seattle will be filled with like spam and porn and all this other stuff because these, uh, the spammers just sit around waiting for that. But uh, they had this cover, how I survived it, how we can end it, and then they said, hey, let's hear about Muslim rage, what you think about it. So you can imagine it went south pretty fast. This happened, and then this happened. <laughs> I I'm feeling the rage right now. Yeah. <laughs> Hansen's really upset. Uh, there, were, there were thousands of these, like all my Muslim friends were just having so much fun with this. And they were much funnier when said by a Muslim. Uh, one of my favorites was about a guy saying, you know, uh, let me see how delicately to put this, but I'm at the airport, you lose your, I lost my nephew and his name is Jihad. Right, what do you do, right? Like, you know, that's, 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 that's a problem, right? Uh, this, is, this is the world of, Hi, hashtag hijack. They asked for this, right? And they got it right back at them when they when the thing. So be very careful with your hashtags. Another idea I have is that we live in a world where we should maximize the marriage of the physical and the digital, the online and the in-person. Think about this event here. This talks a lot about our convening power of AAJA, of Comlead, of UUW, of SPJ, of the Seattle Times, and all of us coming together. But the physical is really important, even in a digital life. And we do a thing in New York every spring in, in February called Social Media Weekend. And I hope you'll all come out to it next year. We have about 500 people from a dozen countries come. And a little conference of 500 people had 12,000 tweets. And they had 
2,000 contributors. So what does that mean? It takes the conference and blows it up and 2,000 people participate. But the most magical, interesting thing is 8.4 million followers of those 2,000 people, right? So how do you get this kind of success? By a very important concept in social media, be semi-obnoxious. The semi is really important. So I'm, I did a piece about how wonderful the Grammys were this year with social media. They were semi-obnoxious about the hashtag and did a really good job. And now I'm working on a piece about how the Oscars failed on social media. They failed because they weren't semi-obnoxious. What do I do at this conference? Every name tag has the hashtag on it. The invitation has the hashtag on it. We show the slides every time with the hashtag. We put Twitter handles everywhere. We activate people to get them activated, right? And we're going to, by the way, take a break in a couple of minutes. So what, you're, what you have to do is this kind of semi-obnoxiousness is very important. And uh, if you Google uh, Grammys, Sri, and CNET, you'll see seven lessons for organizers of events, I'm sorry, from the Grammys. And LL Cool J did a really nice job where he kept mentioning it, but he also did two other things. He would read tweets out loud so that people knew it was worth tweeting about. And second, he also shared pictures of like Carrie Underwood in the dressing room putting on her makeup as kind of behind the scenes. So it was worth following them as well. The Oscars didn't do that and they failed. And you'll see when I post that why that happened. Um, any questions so far about this? So this, this blending of the two is very important. So we're gonna look now at this graphic uh, you might remember that, uh, that uh, Malcolm Gladwell, anybody here a Malcolm Gladwell fan? I'm a big Malcolm Gladwell fan. And he wrote a piece in, December, uh, in October 2010 about social media. Some of you read this. He said, social media is a waste of time. Don't bother because it cannot change anything. And it's nothing compared to what happened in Selma. And you know, it's like, that's the highest standard, right? right? It didn't change the world, so it's gonna, so anyway. Uh, anytime someone writes an article like that, all the people I know in the world send me that article saying, aha, we'd much rather listen to, uh, to uh, Malcolm Gladwell than you, you fool. And they send that to me. And I thought it was a very interesting piece. It was very well written, but it was wrong. And the reason it was wrong was that Malcolm is not on, or was not, or was not on Twitter or Facebook when he wrote the piece. And it was just him kind of examining it and writing it in a kind of academic way and doing a bad job of it. And if you fast forward to the spring, you know what happened in January 25th, the Egyptian revolution happens. And uh, what you're seeing here is that the people who said this was a Facebook revolution are wrong. But people like Malcolm Gladwell who said it had nothing to do with social media are also wrong. And here you're seeing the government of Egypt shut down the internet, right? They understood it's not enough to beat up people in Tahrir. We've got to beat them up on cyberspace as well. And someone had a great line about this. They said the government of Egypt shut down the internet so that Malcolm Gladwell would not be wrong, <laughs> right? That's how much Hosni loves Malcolm. And that's sort of what I want you to kind of think about that. But this idea that we can, we have to combine both of those is, is very important. And you'll see there are some other slides that we want, we have so much other stuff we want to cover. So I'm going to uh, show you this and then we're going to take a break. Um, this is a Twitter handle that I tell everybody to follow. If you ever step outside the United States, you have any family members that ever leave the United States, you must follow at TravelGov and I hope you name check at TravelGov. And here you can see, this is what, an evacuation report, right? They're not going to send you a limo to your hotel saying, please follow us uh, here and please come. They're, they're tweeting it. If you're following, good luck, otherwise too bad, right? So what is the lesson for us from this is you have to be in the game. You have to understand how Twitter works. But there's a parallel. Somebody said, Sri, this is not about this. This is the chopper leaving the top of the embassy in April 1975. Where? in Saigon, right? Now, how did the people in Saigon know? How did the Americans know that the choppers were leaving? Does anybody know this? It's a very interesting, tiny part of American history. How did they know? There was no Twitter. Yep. White Christmas was the song that was the code when they started playing it again and again in April on the local radio station, the local American-owned radio station. That was the time to leave. 
And that's the world we live in now, that what are these tools that we should know about and how do we get in the game? So let me just tell you what we're gonna do when we come back, because I hope you will come back. How many of you are coming back? Most of you, right? I hope. Uh, so here's what we're gonna talk about. When we come back, we're gonna go right into Twitter about optimizing it and taking Twitter to the next level. We're going to do Facebook and see what I believe are, is the most exciting change in the history of Facebook and the most scary, horrifying change in the history of Facebook, and they're the same thing. And then we're gonna look at LinkedIn, uh, Google+, and I'm gonna show you a whole bunch of new tools in kind of a rapid fire mode, because we wanna get out of here by 9.15ish if we can. And um, we're gonna, shall we take, what do you say, Hanson, like a 10 minute break? Yeah, 10 minutes would be good. Okay, I think so we got some water, and there's, there's actually downstairs, there's a food court which may still be open with some right. stuff if you need more food. Right, but more. we can go out for like, you know, a Dutch Street dinner afterwards if you wanna do that. But 10 minutes, please, by, by my Apple time, it's, uh, let's, we'll get started at 8.08, people. 8.08, thank you. Hey, Lon. All right, all right. Let's see, we're mostly still here, right? Raise your hand if you're still here. Yes. Who's hungry? Who is hungry? Can we get the volume up a little bit? Shh. So I want to thank Audrey. Where are you, Audrey? Where are you? Audrey's right here. She brought along some Theo chocolate, and she said she's going to class up this joint over here. So she works at Theo chocolate. So you want to get to know her, right? So what is your Twitter handle, Audrey? It's A underscore N E. R, E, U, S. Good. And as we know, Theo is our local chocolate factor here in Seattle. We have a great relationship with them, and they're just awesome. So All right. Thank you very for good. Coming. Very good. Cool. Okay. Uh, let's see. So now we're going to jump right into uh, Twitter and how we use Twitter better, right? So look, we got one more person tweeted this. This would be actually a good moment to retweet that so that people who um, might be tuning in now can see that. So I'm going to just take this and tweet it one more time just to get this out there. So I'm just going to take that and copy. And I told you it's like watching paint dry. M Moni, what are you thinking about just generally? Like what <laughs> now as you, you think about people doing social, what's a good tip that you have for Twitter? Just Share some Chris, Twitter tips. Um, yeah, go. Yeah, Crystal. actually, somebody was, was uh, Chris, right in the front, was, uh, and I were having a discussion uh, just about this, actually. Um, and, and he was sharing the concern that lots of people have, like, how do you know what to say? Um, and I think it's, it's interesting because innate to all of us, I think, is, is uh, an instinct for what is interesting. Because, you know, imagine you're walking down the street, and you're walking with a friend. And you see something interesting. There's an interesting restaurant, or somebody's in a really weird car, or whatever. You know when to speak up and kind of go to your friend and go, look at that, isn't that cool? So when I'm walking alone and I have that moment, I tweet. Um, so that's one example. So I think that people, it's easy for us to know what to share with people or who are actually physically around us. It's a little harder to know what to share with this you know, new sort of vague, hard to put uh, parameters around digital network, but I actually think the instinct is exactly the same. It's just your perspective. So if you're looking at Twitter and you're wondering, what do I actually share? What, wh wh how do I know what's interesting? Um, you know, just, just remember, it's really a very natural instinct, what, what is interesting. And it, it's different for every person. So, um, so I don't know, I'm, uh, I, think, I think you have to learn as you go, and the only way to learn is to just do it. So that's another thing I say, is set your bar kind of low. <laughs> And there's a delay, there you go, you hey, can see the delay hey, on there, wait, there you go. When's there my there hand going up? <laughs> uh, live stream is such a cool tool, and let's thank the folks in the yes. back who are doing Scott, so Scott much hard work. Who's my good colleague and friend, associate well, Let's director. give his Twitter handle, you, Hanson. Shadow puppet. Shadow, puppet. Han puppet. Shadow Puppets, Hanson, can you give us, uh, are you on Twitter, can you get his Twitter handle? Yeah, and he's uh, Scott Macklin, actually, M-A-C-K-L-I-N, Scott Macklin. Uh, thank Twitter. you. Awesome. This is, there's so much work goes into this stuff, it's easy to... I'm doing the easy part of this, and then people can tweet. And there you go, S. S. Macklin, and uh, he's back here. That's good. Look, and you can see me point. It's pretty funny. All right. Let's go in here, and let's talk about some cool Twitter things that you can do. I've just tweeted that we're trending in Seattle, so go ahead and post it. I would have made this better if I had actually posted the picture of us trending in Seattle, and I didn't do that. So, 
No, no, I, no, I didn't do that because I'm standing up here. I haven't seen it. <laughs> Don't jump at me, please. A uh, couple of thoughts on Twitter. I call Twitter email without the guilt. What does that mean? In, you always feel bad when you have an email pending. Nicole wrote to me like last week and then I didn't reply for like three, four days and I felt bad, it was like, I felt bad. It's like those New Yorker issues that you subscribe to and they pile up next to your bed and you feel bad about it, right? That's sort of how I feel about, about email. But, but I call Twitter email without the guilt because it doesn't matter if you miss things. And I've missed a lot of stuff standing here in front of you for the last few hours, right? Um, I will miss thousands of tweets, but if it's important, it will resurface. It will be reposted and reshared is what I believe. Or someone will have tagged me with it, so I'll be able to see it. Or I know the hashtag and I'll be able to see it. So those are all important ways in which you can think about this. When you look at my uh, Twitter, and, and by the way, somebody came up to me and said, what about organizations? Almost everything I talk about has some organizational value or in, as you do it for organizations. And just think, you know, we, we, there's a lot of stuff we're not going to cover even in three and a half hours, but there will be things that you can tease out of this. And the things I say about the bio, for example, obviously work for, um, for uh, organizations and not just individual people. But look at my other, other thing that I'll point out about my tweets is that there, there's a lot of blue on here, right? So I tell people, make your tweets blue, but not like Eddie Murphy blue, but I mean like links, right? Look at how everything has a hashtag or an at mention or a link you know, or a hashtag, all of this stuff. Why do you want to do that? Because you want people to be able to click and see more stuff, right? But I should tell you that uh, if you tell, I said this to a group of my students, I said, I didn't mean Eddie Murphy blue. They thought, why are you talking about the Shrek donkey from Shrek? What are they? They didn't know that Eddie Murphy was very blue in 84. You remember Raw? Some of you remember Raw? Like, that's Eddie Murphy that I remember, not the donkey from Shrek. And, <laughs> and so make your tweets blue is a, is a tip I have for you. And one of the things I feel like was we haven't name checked enough people tonight. So we're going to name check a bunch of people right now. And we're going to start by name checking Brian Stelter. Do you all know who he is? This is a young reporter at the New York Times. He was in that documentary front page, uh, page one, I'm sorry. And look what he does on his bio. Look how nice and deep his bio is. And again, name check him. Tweet at him and say, hey, at Brian Stelter. Itch, itch. By the way, let me know if anybody responds to you or retweets you or posts or follows you if that happens because that always happens when you do this. And Shri, it's also worth pointing out how Brian got that job, right? Yeah, well, he did it by being a great on in those in the old technology of blogging, and he he was hired. Even he was he was doing it wonderfully. So look at this. I love TV. I write about the New York Times. I write about it for the New York Times. I have a book coming out April 23rd. And then look at this. Very important. How many of you have your email address? in your Twitter bios? Raise your hands. Few of you. Everybody who's a journalist or if you're an organization must have an email address because not everybody wants to connect with you via Twitter itself. And he goes one step further by putting a phone number. He used to have his cell phone number on there. And you notice this is not his New York Times email. Why? Because he wants to be found. So please tweet at him and say Sri is using you as a great example uh, here. But the other idea I have about this is that every reporter should be findable. And I learned this from a guy named Bob Woodward, where he is still listed in the DC phone book. Why? Because he wants the next deep throat to call him and not some young whippersnapper at BuzzFeed or at uh, uh, Politico, right? So he doesn't want to be found by at Mike Allen. And I mean, he doesn't want the source to go to at Mike Allen or at BuzzFeed Ben, who you know is uh, ben Smith from BuzzFeed, right? And when people say, well, I can't do that, and I'm not saying be listed, put your home address or anything like that, but I'm saying this idea that we should be findable is very, very important. And I tell people, are you busier than Bob Woodward? Are you more important than Bob Woodward that people shouldn't find you? But think about that in this context and think about putting your just your email address on there because people want to find you. And I'll give you an example. One of my uh, former students is a woman named Amy B. Wong. Amy B. spelt Wang, but pronounced Wong. There's another Amy, in AJ, there are two Amy Wongs, and they both spell it W-A-N-G. And this is Amy B. Wong. The other one works in Portland, and you might know her. 
Look at this beautiful bio, right, where she says, reporter, I cover Northeast Phoenix, Sky Harbor, airport, city parks. Tell people what you do on Twitter. Be very clear. You people take 10 seconds to decide whether to follow you or not. And then gives her email address. And I did an article about how she was able to get a story and a source to contact her because she had her email address in her bio. That was the only reason that that person called her. And I find this a lot of times where reporters will contact sources via various methods, but it's your obligation to contact sources by the best possible method for the source, not for you. Right? So I hate it when reporters contact me via Facebook messaging system. Why? Because I cannot forward it. I cannot save it. I cannot put it in a folder. I cannot CC somebody. I, I have the answer. I know the right person to help you, but you wrote to me in the wrong medium. Right? Different people have different things. It's up to you to find out which one it is. And I do a lot of, you know, talk to a lot of reporters. So say hi to Amy if you, if you get a chance. 